Doty, thank you so much for making time for Meteo Podcast. Uh, today in the afternoon, you will give a talk uh, in the audience that will be primary school students. So uh, I want to start with a typical question, actually. Uh, I'm sure you answered too many times before. Uh, what it takes to be astronaut? How was it for you? How did you prepare uh, to be selected on uh, on the team on the ISS? Yes, well, this is a popular question, and becoming an astronaut is uh, a challenge, but also a really rewarding challenge. So, um, first, uh, of course, before you can even apply to become an astronaut, you'll have to study for many years um, and go to the university or to college and study there in um, either science, technology, engineering or math, so what we call the STEM fields. And then um, with today's astronaut classes, they want even a master's or a doctorate degree, or you can also go the route of the military and uh, uh, perhaps becoming a pilot or going to um, one of those academies and then getting an advanced degree as well. And so that is the first uh, challenge. And mm -hmm. then of course you have to apply. and. They don't have application years every year. Uh, there's a call in this in the United States, maybe every two to four years, um, and that's similar for our European space agencies, JAXA space agencies. Uh, so um, you have to wait for this call, and. And then you go online and you put in all your information about what you've accomplished up to that point, and then you wait. Yeah. And that part is really challenging mm -hmm. to wait. You studied geology, by the way, right? Yes, mm -hmm. I did. Then uh, you applied for a uh, for being a part of uh, a NASA team. Yes. Uh, and then you been on ISS. That's correct. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, how was it up there? I mean, uh, your daily routine and your preparations before you go on the ISS. I think it took quite a, a long um, process of education, like survival skills, etc. So I actually wonder about them. Uh, yeah. Well, we well, we start out when we first are hired into uh, the astronaut corps. We come in as a class, and I think students like to know that even astronauts go to school. So we go to essentially astronaut school, mm -hmm. and it can last up to two years. Um, and in the beginning, like you said, we go through survival training. We do this because, of course, we're flying in uh, airplanes when we're doing our training. But then when we go to fly to space, we'll also be in vehicles that have to return. And some of these vehicles are now returning to um, land uh, or to water. And so being able to do survival skills in those areas. Then we do flight training. We use an airplane uh, for our training because it's like something that is in um, a real risk environment. So. You have to always check the weather. You have to always know how the systems of the airplane are working. And that is really good teamwork. And we can get into an airplane, you know, once a week versus, mm -hmm. well, you might, like myself, I only got one space flight. So you may not get into a space vehicle all the time. And then we learn about our vehicles that we're going to fly in. So in my case, it was a space shuttle, but today's crews are uh, going to the International Space Station. So they're going to learn about the systems of the space station, as well as the vehicles that are taking them there. Um, and right now that's commercial vehicles, uh, or um, in the case of cosmonauts uh, using the Soyuz. And so you, that takes some time to learn because you just learn the basics then they start throwing in malfunctions. And I say they, but that's like the people that train us. They're like our teachers. And they throw in malfunctions so that we start to see, okay, how does the vehicle respond? How do I respond? And uh, and then um, we also do spacewalk training. That is done in a huge swimming pool in suits that look like the spacesuits that go outside, but of course are different because they're in the water, so they're lighter and uh, take out some of the equipment that you don't need in the water. That's really rewarding training. It's some of my favorite. We do um, robotic arm training because we use different robotic arms on the space station to either move crew members or to move big pieces of equipment into place because the space station is always being upgraded 
Um, sometimes more modules are being added, and even some vehicles have been birthed to the space station with the robotic arm. So that's an important piece of training. And, uh, and then now we're training crew members to return to the moon. So we're starting to do a lot more intense geology training, uh, going to different parts of the world to look at rocks um, and what the surface of the moon could potentially look like in these places. Mm -hmm. So that, that takes you about two years of training. Then you graduate. And then you can be assigned to a mission. And while you're waiting, you're supporting other missions that are already going on at the space station, and you're supporting your own training, like advanced training, um, and then also su uh, supporting the teams at NASA and developing equipment and uh, different ways of operating at either on the space station or on the lunar surface. Mm -hmm. So that part is really fun. Yeah, after the training, uh, you went on a mission. That's right. And... Um How was daily routine up there? Uh, how did you live uh, with other astronauts and how was the daily mechanics of uh, International Space Station? Yeah, well, um, because we were a visiting vehicle, we didn't have our own bedroom in the space station. So uh, current astronauts usually have their own bedroom, which is like a little closet sort mm -hmm. of, and you hang your sleeping bag there, maybe have a few photos, a special computer. But for um, ourselves, like that were on the space shuttle, we uh, had a sleeping bag and we could pick, did you want to sleep on the ceiling, on the walls, on the floor? Where mm -hmm. did you want to sleep? Very But light. then you mm -hmm. had to pack it up every day. And we had some chores in the morning because there's only one uh, place to get ready for you, like using the toilet and uh, brushing your teeth, all those normal morning things. So with seven of us crew members, you're waiting. So we have some chores. Um, we even like open uh, shades on the window because For you pull them at night. Or something. I mean, uh, actually, this is something that I personally, uh, I'm personally curious about. Um, you have uh, oxygen supplies, but uh, how about the fresh air kind of thing? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you? Um, I mean, how is it provided on the ISS? Yes. So on the International Space Station, there's actually an environmental control system that's. Uh, several different pieces of equipment that all work together. So from your wastewater, your urine and your uh, sweat and uh, saliva, uh, some of this is recovered. And actually from electrolysis, we split the hydrogen off from the oxygen. So that's how we can create more oxygen. Of course, we breathe out carbon dioxide. So that has to be absorbed. Um, when the carbon dioxide is absorbed, it goes into one piece of equipment. And then some of um, the, the carbon can combine with the hydrogen as it's like baked off. And that will create some methane that's vented overboard. And uh, there's a little bit, uh, the, the oxygen again. So um, we have this really impressive environmental control system and that's how we continue to have oxygen and we still have to have some vehicles fly a little bit of replacement but mm -hmm. uh it's pretty slick system and, and we really need that system as we look to going to the to the moon again uh, did you do any spacewalk you mentioned uh in the training part you uh, you were trained for uh spacewalks I Did was trained for them. I was a backup, so I didn't actually personally get to go outside. But my job was then to talk to our two crew members that did go outside. They went out over three different days. And I talked to them the whole time for mm -hmm. six to eight hours. Um, and so, you know, in all spacewalks, things have to change in the real time. Mm -hmm. And we had some changes that happened that... Uh, rippled through our spacewalk. So we had to solve some problems. We worked with the ground to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so how about when you came back? I mean, um, did you go through any disorientation problems? I mean, how did you, um, again, get along with your uh, normal routine on Earth? Yeah, well, your normal routine in space, uh, you have to adapt for sure, because how we take care of our bodies is different in space, even thinking about like, I wear contacts, even thinking about that, and knowing like, I wear a daily one, and you have to throw it away. And 
to, you don't just throw things in a trash can. You mm -hmm. have to actually like put it into a piece of tape, put this tape to, uh, together, then put that into a trash can with a lid that secures down so things don't float away. So just our daily routines are different. But when I came back to Earth, yeah, our bodies, uh, well, they're getting used to gravity again because we've been in microgravity for, in my case, a couple of weeks, but for some astronauts, uh, months, even Currently, we uh, we just returned an astronaut who was there for over yeah, a I saw year. That. Yeah, Frank Rubio was there for over a year. Mm -hmm. So your body has to readjust to gravity. And initially, the biggest thing that you notice has changed is your balance system. Um, you are off balance. Uh, your brain is not necessarily listening to your inner ear where you get a lot of signals. It's kind of stop listening. So it's reintroducing those signals. And it usually takes a few days before you kind of feel 100%. Um, other things that have changed in your body may have been like your muscles and a little bit of bone density. Um, so that's why exercising in space is so important, especially for those people living there for months. And um, and then blood volume changes a little bit. You don't, ha your heart doesn't have to work very hard to get blood to your brain. So you don't need uh, quite all the blood volume. And we, we call them chicken legs, but your legs get, a, uh, in the, especially in the lower legs, get a little bit smaller and you don't have as much blood volume. Mm -hmm. So you'll, that, that part you might notice if you're a runner like myself. Like, you work out up there yeah. on the space station. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, we have for, for the legs, for the yeah, other muscles. for all these things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's not quite the same as being here on Earth. Um, but yeah, they have a treadmill, mm -hmm. um, also a cycle ergometer, or it looks like a bicycle. And, and then also a piece of equipment we call the advanced resistive exercise device. But it looks like an astronaut's lifting weights, but mm -hmm. really they're pulling against the resistance. All of those things in combination keep your heart your bones, your muscles, all very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, about the food, but I have a little something here. Ah, <laughs> surprise uh, food. This is something ah. we found, like, mm, uh, it's like a real astronaut food. So do you eat <laughs> something oh, like that? Oh, is this the ice cream? <laughs> yeah. We do not is this have a really, this. <laughs> a real astronaut food? No, it's like a, but... But it is in the way that astronauts have to have rehydrated. So uh -huh. this uses your own saliva to mm -hmm. rehydrate it. But we usually have food in a pouch. Mm -hmm. And the pouch usually has like a nozzle here. And then uh -huh. you poke a needle in and inject water. Mm -hmm. And then you rehydrate food. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything from like macaroni and cheese to mm -hmm. maybe some chicken, some beef, things like that. Uh -huh. But we can actually have real ice cream in space. Oh. Yeah, because um, uh, the SpaceX vehicle has, um, so the, the Dragon, not the capsule that the crew members are coming up in, although maybe they can have that too. But when we send cargo, there's a freezer and we have that freezer to return um, samples, biological samples from either crew members or uh, from experiments. But you can send ice cream up, oh, so they can have great. ice cream in yeah, space. This was from uh, the Smithsonian Museum. They were, yes, yeah. they say this too. I know, so it's fun. Uh -huh. I've had it here on Earth. Oh, great. <laughs> so fun. Uh -huh. uh, uh, lastly, actually, uh, I want to ask you about your STEM activities. You devote much of your time uh, for STEM activities. You have many talks and uh, you have activities, uh, especially for children. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, in one of your TED Talks, you uh, mentioned about your love for sci-fi and for science communication activities. So, can you tell us about, uh, I mean, uh, what are your favorite sci-fi works? Uh, how are your STEM activities are going? How do you like the recent trends in STEM? Yeah, well, um, I grew up watching Star Wars and... Mm -hmm. I really loved Princess Leia. I think she was a really important role model for me from the movies. And um, but then, as we've seen newer movies come out about space, I think one of my favorites. First, I read the book by Andy Weir, but uh, of course about um, the Martian and mm -hmm. uh, how to live and work and operate on the surface of Mars. And I found it super interesting. But yeah, I really think it. It's so important to have STEM activities um, for all people uh, because so many of 
the things that we're trying to understand and do better on Earth and solve, like uh, climate problems, um, having clean water, having a good environment, growing food, having enough food, all of these things are rooted in the STEM fields. So even if that's not your passion, I just would want people to understand it so that we can vote and make decisions about it. Um, but I really enjoy doing outreach and space is always inspiring to young people. So um, I can go in and for many different uh groups. I will come in as an astronaut and talk to students or help them design experiments that can possibly fly to space. Um, and uh, it's just really rewarding to do that. Of course, my background is in teaching, and I love to share what I learned about space what um, and what we're getting ready to do as we return to the moon, but in a very different way. Um, and I'm really, really glad to see enthusiasm for STEM activities. I, as we were talking earlier, I was able to go to Technofest uh, yesterday in Izmir, and there were thousands of people there. And many of those people were families with young children. And there were lots of activities for youngsters to build models or build build um, spacecraft, aircraft, and test it out. And that's how you learn, right? Testing, applying, um, and having that investment from your society and also your parents, so coming together. So this is a really good demonstration of uh, like what we can all do together. Uh, do you have any uh, big projects coming up? I mean, as far as STEM activities concerned, anything in your mind for the future? Yeah, well, um, I will continue working uh, in outreach. I'm right now working with the University of Washington and actually teaching a class to university students. And they're uh, giving them the details about what is happening for lunar exploration. And it's exciting to think that um, like as as countries around the world that we're trying to understand more about the South Pole and the presence of water there and other things that teach us about uh, the beginnings of our solar system and then also how we can work on this surface, um, which will then hopefully be a stepping stone into Mars. And I continue to do outreach through um, nonprofits that I work with. So I was a little girl when the Challenger vehicle exploded and that tragedy could have just ended with the loss of seven lives, which was just really upsetting. But it it uh, the families decided that's not how we want it to end. We want to invest in centers where we educate young people about space and about STEM. And so I do a lot of outreach outreach work there um, with those centers, and it's an incredible way to inspire young people. Um, so I'll keep doing that mm -hmm. for the next couple of years, too. Great. Yeah. Uh, Dodi, thank you so much for making time for us. I know you have a tight schedule. It was very fun to have you in our studio. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. It's wonderful.